think we all use the most basic of social media, which is email. Uh, but then I started a blog back in 2006 when I was CEO of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. In addition, as time went on, I got more active in Facebook and on Twitter and LinkedIn and Google+. And I found that those media were, were um, useful in a number of respects. First of all, as a communications vehicle within the hospital. Um, for example, people in their 20s generally don't use email, uh, but they will use Facebook or texting or chatting and so on. And I found it very helpful to learn from people in that age group what was going on on their floors or their divisions of the hospital through Facebook. Um, Twitter I found to be uh, my librarian. Um, I would follow a few people who I know were well-read and thoughtful and they would often cite articles from technical journals or from the newspapers about things going on in healthcare. And it basically meant that they were surveying the literature for me. If you're a young doctor or a nurse, Previously, the only way you could get your thoughts out on an issue was to have a peer-reviewed journal approve an article. And that process would take months and months, and you'd be lucky. You'd be one of, whatever, 20 or 30 people to get it published, and you'd have to wait two years. Now, if you have a thought about something, you write it. You post it. It's up. There's nothing like having to write something down that causes you to have to think about it before you write it, at least if you want it to make any sense at all and be persuasive. Um, and as I've talked to those young doctors and nurses who write their own blogs, they tell me it's been intensely rewarding for them, professionally and personally. Plus, they've made connections with people literally around the world because the, the blogosphere is worldwide. It, it doesn't matter where you were, where you are. And you can connect with people all around. The dean of the hospitalist movement is Bob Wachter at UCSF uh, in, in California. He writes a very, very thoughtful blog and has commentary on many, many things of that sort. On the patient side, the, 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 um, the, the best blogger, I think, is a fellow who's called ePatient Dave. His real name is Dave DeBronckhart. He was a kidney cancer patient, indeed, in our hospital. And as a result of the experience he went through, he's become one of the foremost patient advocates in terms of uh, helping people to engage in true partnerships, uh, clinicians and patients, and freeing up data and the like. I don't think there are many dangers in using social media, but the ones that exist relate to the common sense use of patient-specific information and other personal information. HIPAA exists to protect privacy, and other countries have similar laws. And HIPAA doesn't say that you shan't talk about a patient on a blog. It just says you shouldn't talk about it at all to anybody that doesn't have a right to know. So if you just apply the same thoughtful standards to your behavior on social media as you would walking down a corridor on the telephone, in an email, in an elevator, it'll be fine. If you don't, the world will see it in about 30 seconds, and that's the danger. The first rule about social media is to assume that everything you put on will be public, that privacy goes away. So don't write something you don't want the world to see. The second rule about social media is try it. Just experiment. See what works. See what fits your personality and your style. I would say to people, write in your own voice. Discover your voice and use it. Next step is to engage the rest of the blogosphere. Be collaborative with other people in terms of sharing blog sites and the like. And usually they'll reciprocate and that will help generate traffic. And, most importantly, write regularly. If you're not writing at least three days a week, people will stop coming back because they'll think there's nothing new.